everybody. I want to welcome you back to another episode of Thursday Night Live. This is, uh, yeah, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. I'm um, Tim here with Fly Fishing Bow River Outfitters. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here tonight as well as everybody who's watching from home. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in and watching what we're up to. Just a few announcements before we get going today. Um, don't forget, if you're here, tip your bartender. Um, I know she appreciates that. Last, uh, last Thursday, we had, or Friday, sorry, we had our first showing IF4. We were pretty excited about it, premiered our film that was in it. Um, great turnout, was awesome. A lot of you guys were here, so I thank you again for that. Um, we are showing it again next Thursday. It'll be at the same place, so Canyon Meadows, 7 o'clock. Um, purchase your tickets online. Filmfest.com is probably your best option. Um, it sold out last week, and we had to turn people away, so it kind of sucked to have to do that. So go ahead and buy them online ahead of time. Um, yeah, besides that, we'll have another showing of it in Red Deer if you're from up our way. Um, that'll be most likely, it seems, February 27th is what it's going to be, but I'll confirm that um, as well. But because we are hosting it again next week, we won't be here next week. So again, we won't be here tying next week because we're hosting the film festival one more time here in Calgary. So we won't be tying next week, but we'll resume the following Thursday um, and get right back to it. Um, one other thing on January 30th, excuse me, um, Caraville has some type of event going on here, so mark in your calendar, we won't be here on January 30th. So just a couple days we're going to miss, um, but other than that, we'll be every Thursday we'll be here. We'll give you lots of notice as well on our Facebook page and Instagram um, about those dates not being here. Um, Rob Merkley, uh, he's not here very often, but what, a, what an awesome guy. He's always diligent with us, keeps in contact all the time, sits at home and ties with us. He, uh, he donated uh, money again for this week's materials, so we want to thank Rob for that. It, those donations go a long ways in helping us keep this free for you guys every week, so thanks to Rob for that. Mm -hmm. So this week we've got uh, two flies on the docket. So we're kind of in this phase that we're going to sit in for the next few weeks. Um, that's going to be... <laughs> I hate you, Dana. <laughs> the teleprompter is really cool until you write stuff up there you don't want to read. <laughs> Anyways, now I'm totally flustered. So we're going to tie, uh, tie two flies that are going to kind of follow this theme of um, Bow River flies. So we're going to, this week we're going to do a Copper John. We're going to do it in red because this is a great color for this time of year if you're brave in the weather and you're getting out there to fish. Red Copper John is really good. Um, then we're going to do a um, Bow River bugger. So literally created on this river for this river. Also another great fly. We're going to go through that. We have done this one in the past, but we're going to review this one again and go through it. And then for the next probably month at least, we're going to pretty much slide into just different flies that um, us as guides use. We're not, we don't mind giving some secrets away because they're not really secrets. They're common flies, but they work. So we're going to take you through kind of a whole bunch of Bow River flies. Um, then we'll do a little bit of a salt month. We're going to do about half a month of salt, and then we're going to get into our mountain march like we did last year and just stick to all those flies that we recommend for the mountains. Okay, so as always, um, if you need help, don't hesitate. We got Brandon here, Scott here, lots of guys who know what they're doing. We got <clears throat> more help at the back, so don't hesitate, put your hand up. And uh, if you need me to slow down, let me know too, okay? If you guys have any questions from home, don't hesitate to type them in, and Dana can either ask me up here in his fancy teleprompter, or he might just answer you himself. Okay, so our first fly we're gonna do is we're gonna start off with this Copper John. Uh, we're gonna do it in, in this red color, like I'd said. Really, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't tie a lot of nymphs. Some people make them look really good. I'm a functional tire, so that's what you're going to get out of me today is a functional fly. Um, pretty simple pattern though. Um, we've dumbed it down a little bit from even what some pattern, the actual pattern calls for as far as all the materials, but this is a very functional, looks good in the water, catches a lot of fish. Okay. So in your packages, in your little bag here, you should have had a couple of different hooks, one bigger one and one small one. That smaller one's the one we're going to use. We're going to put that bead on. So go ahead and get that out, put the bead on the hook and get it secured in your vise. And I will do the same. So tonight we're going to, this is a, a pretty good size, this is a size 14. We're using a Mustad um, Nymph Sprout hook tonight. This can be tied a lot smaller, not sure I would venture much, much bigger than this one. Um, for our waters, but you definitely could get smaller. But they're really, they get really a lot more finicky to tie as you go, even smaller, okay? So then you're gonna have a piece of 
lead-free wire in there. So th this week we're going to use um, 0.02 is the size. So you take that, we want to get maybe five wraps, six wrap of, wraps of it on there. So how I'm going to kind of do that is I'm going to come grab the tag end. I can start down here at the butt because I'm going to be able to push it forward. So we're going to go four, five, six, let's say seven. So you can either use your nails to pinch that off or kind of go a little deeper into your, uh, your scissors. You want to kind of pinch that tag down so that it's not sticking up and it'll slide up into that cone quite nicely. Then just push it forward. And now where my tag is, I can see I'm going to put a couple more wraps because I want this to come, my wraps to end just into that, the hook point. Okay, so you can see there it's just barely into the hook point. I'll do the same thing. Don't wreck your good scissors. If you are like I just did, you'll see I'll reach deeper into my scissor to cut it because we do most of our fine cutting up at the tips. What can I grab for you? Uh, I don't have any wire in my... Any wire, for sure. Uh, or the copper. Or the copper. Brandon, you had one job. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to tie with for thread tonight, I'm just going to use a UTC 140, no problem. A UTC 140, I'm going to use it in black. Black for both flies, but I'll use a, a one, or sorry, this is a 70. I'm going to use 140 for the next fly. So a little bit thinner. We don't want to stack up a whole bunch of um, threads on this and make it look too bulky. So I like to use a little bit smaller thread. So I'm going to start that thread just behind where I just put those wraps of lead wire on, just secure it in there. And then what we want to do is we want to work back up over those thread wraps. Once we've built a little bit of a dam behind it, we're just going to work it up. Not that we need to cover it all up. We just want to make it so it's secure and it's not going to move on us. So we've got a really fun part coming up next. So next thing in there, you're going to have some goose bites which if you've never worked with them before, after tonight you might never work with them again. They're not a ton of fun, but once you kind of get the hang of them, they're not awful to work with. Yeah, they're, they're probably actually my least favorite material to work with. So this is just a stripped goose by it in brown. So it kind of comes on these strands like this. If you tip them up, you can see that it's it stands up, you're actually just taking off two of those. So I think in your packs you'll see them. Some of you probably have a lot more than just two, um, but that's okay. So we're just gonna use two of them. So I'm gonna reach in and get two of them out. You can just strip them off. They're kind of on a stem and you just strip them off of that. So I'm gonna show you how to put these on one at a time. If you're super talented, like I am not with these, you can put both on at the same time. I find for myself, if I don't put them both on, or if I put them on both at the same times, they just never end up sitting where I want them to at the end. So I'm going to go one at a time. So how I want to measure this is I want about half of the length of the hook shank out the rear end. Okay? And you're going to notice that when you hold that goose by it, it has a natural curve in one direction. So when I tie this on, I want that to curve out away from the fly, not back in towards the, the hook. Okay? So again, you can see that little bit of bend is in this direction. I'm going to shape that so that it pushes out away. So when you have them both tied on, it looks like the tail has splayed itself. Okay? So I'm going to come in, again, measuring so that it's about, you want to go about half to three quarters of the length of the hook shank out the back end. And you're going to tie it in right in front of that, those lead wraps that you put on. You can see it's just on there. Now, we are going to work our thread back down once we have the other one on, and that will help us actually splay them out. But we got to get them both tied in first. So go ahead, go ahead and put the first one on and then flip it over and go to the other side and you're going to put the other one on and try to keep them at equal length. And you're not tying them directly on the side of the fly. You want them to actually tip up almost a quarter up onto the, onto the top of the hook shank, but you don't want it to be totally on top. And then when we tighten them down, they're going to splay out for us quite nicely. They should. It's normally the second one that's a little trickier to get into place. Take a nice loose wrap and then a couple of nice tight ones. And so now if you look at this, I've got, it's kind of a hard angle to see on there, but I got both of them on. I've got all that extra stuff up by the, the bead still, but we're going to get rid of that here in a second. So now I just want you to take some, some wraps down the hook shank. But be careful because this is a really easy time for them to roll. 
So you want to have them in place in a way that they're not going to move around that hook shank. So sometimes I'll even do what I've just done now. I know you can't see because my hand's in the way, but I've actually gone in and separated those bites with my fingers. And so that when I'm wrapping down the hook shank towards them, they're already kind of got a natural splay going. And now you'll see as I go that they're, they're already wanting to splay out for me. And you can manipulate them on the hook a little bit as well. Don't get frustrated with them. They're, they're not an easy material to work with. We want to stop our thread just past the barb of the hook. If you left your barb, in, barb on still, you'll be able to see that. Okay? So they should have splayed. As you kind of tighten your wraps, they actually want it, it almost naturally pulls them out a little bit. So once you know that you've had, you have those nice and secure, you got some wraps moving back up, I want you to go in there and snip out the butt ends of it. But make sure you don't do that prematurely. And then work your thread back up over top of them. So if you've done it, if you've tied them in right behind where those lead wire wraps ended, you'll notice that it almost smoothed out that, that gap that you'd have had in the, um, the disc discrepancy between the thicknesses. It should have worked itself out quite nicely and it should have a nice little taper to it now. So then we're gonna go in and grab that red wire that we have there. So today we are using a, you pass it to me. The reason, uh, you, I mean, obviously we're doing it red. Normally it's copper. This is ultra wire and brass. BR is the size and just red. So what we're gonna do, so that we can maintain that same thickness and profile on the, on the fly, we're gonna come up to just behind the head and tie in that wire. So just behind the head, tie in that wire. And we're gonna almost push it to that back side as we wrap down. And we don't want to wrap too far up under those bias because then we're going to move them again. So come right to where you finished your wraps on it. And then we're going to bring our thread back up. And you got to imagine that we're going to build a thorax to this fly. So we're going to build an area where it looks like there's um, an abdomen and then where there's legs that we're going to create with this, uh, with a feather that comes off the side. So we basically want two thirds of the, of the usable hook shank to be wire. And the last third is going to be that thorax that we create. So about where I've left my thread is where I'd like you to imagine leaving yours. Um, I've left about a third of that hook shank left to work with, okay? And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab that wire and I'm gonna do touching wraps all the way up until I meet my thread, okay? So around, keep nice touching wraps. Dan King's not here, but he says hi. I wonder where he is. He should be here. The Dan Juan himself. He should know how to work with red wire. So nice touching wraps. If you find that you've left a bit of a gap, you can just unwind it a little bit. Just make sure you maintain pressure on it because if you let go of it, it'll, it'll unwind on you. And that is not as much fun to redo. It's okay if you have some little small gaps in there. We're just generally trying to create the coloring to look predominantly red, okay? So once we figure that we've got about two thirds of that hook shank covered, then we're just gonna tie off that wire, okay? So make sure you do a couple wraps behind on each side of it, and you can either helicopter it off. So a way of doing that is bringing your bobbin right up and pressing against your hook shank, and then just so that's supporting the hook and then you just helicopter it off, which is exactly like it sounds like. You're just, um, if you can pin it down. You're just, <laughs> not my, my cup of tea. You're just creating friction on that wire until it breaks off. Like so. So that should have brought us to that point. Next material that we're gonna be looking for is you've got a piece of this Mylar flash. What did I do with it? Right here. So this is just Uni Mylar number 12 and just a pearl color. Um, this pattern, sometimes you'll put, you'll use this as well as like a black flashback um, that you'll, or a scud back or something that you'll put on as well. It does help splay the legs of the, the hen hackle that we'll put on here in a moment. But today we're just gonna go with one piece of Mylar. So go ahead and grab that. We're gonna end up tying that in just behind the head of the fly. 
And this you want to get right on top, okay? So try to nail that right on top of the fly. Like if you see what I just did, it's not easy to try to get the very tip of the material, but once I've got a wrap or two, I can tug on that and it'll pull it back to right where I tied it in. Then we want to just take a few thread wraps back, making sure that that stays right on top of the hook. And then we're going to again come back forward. Next thing we're looking for is we got that peacock hurl. So this is what we're going to use to create the thorax of the fly. So I don't know how many pieces you have in there, maybe one, two, ten. Um, you could use as little as one. I like to use two. It just makes less wrapping up. So remember, this stuff is a really unique material, but it is also very brittle, especially up at the tips. So what we like to do is come in and maybe take off that top inch. It's very fragile, just get rid of that. Realign the tips of that peacock hurl, and we're gonna do exactly like we just did with the last one. Tie it in right behind the bead. And bring thread wraps back right up against that red wire. And then again, we'll bring our thread forward to right behind the bead. Ooh, I lost one of mine. Really unique material, but like I said before, it can be kind of a annoying thing to work with just because it is so fragile. Okay, so now that we got those together, we're just going to wrap those forward to just behind the bead. And you can kind of wrap back on itself maybe once or twice here or there just to kind of make sure you get that nice buggy looking abdomen or sorry uh, thorax so it pops up quite nice once you feel like you've built a nice prominent looking thorax just come in and tie it off slide your thread behind it make sure you get a couple wraps behind a couple wraps in front as always this stuff will really unwind on you in a hurry just because it is quite slippery if you missed your spot How you guys doing? Keeping up okay? No news is good news? <laughs> okay, now in your package you will have found a tiny little, find one here to show you. It's just a piece of hand cape. What did I do with mine? There it is. So hen cape is what it's actually supposed to be. This is cheating a little bit. This is actually taken off a pheasant, but I really like it. It looks quite similar. Um, what you're looking for is we're actually going to create the legs that are um, basically coming through the body at this point. And how we're going to do that is just a kind of a unique, a unique way of doing this. So in a lot of flies, you would see there's actually a collar built out of a small piece of hackle like this. Um, but this time we're going to, I'll show you how we're going to change that up a little bit. So what I want you to do is grab that, come up to the very tips, and you want to expose the very tip of it. So about that much, okay? And you want to keep it even so that you've pulled the same amount of fibers down on either side of that. And you're gonna go in and you're gonna snip that right there. Okay, snipped it out. Now I want you to go back. You can pull that stuff forward and I want you to go get rid of all the fluff at the back of the feather. It just gets in the way for when you're trying to work with this thing. So I'm just really trying to get rid of it. Um, I can tell you just from experience of doing this enough, it's okay to take off some more of those back fibers. The less you have on there, it's kind of the easier it is to work with, but we need, we're gonna be designing some legs out of it. So I'll show you how much that I, I will leave. So I'll pull a couple more down. So that's plenty, okay? Doing a little bit of work ahead of time to kind of prepare what you're gonna do with it often makes this a lot easier on us. So also when you look at this feather, you can tell it also has a direction that it naturally curves. That's what we wanna set onto the hook. So you can see if you had it the other direction, you laid it on there, it looks like those legs are just reaching off into space. We want those to come down and when we tie them in to kind of curve down around the body of it and then we're going to use this, we're going to pull this through and tighten it down on top of it. Okay, so it'll make, make a little bit more sense in a minute here, but try to get a little bit better angle. Maybe we'll turn this sideways for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're going to 
lay this on top. We're gonna put a thread wrap over top of it to hold those fibers in place, but split in half. So when you look at that feather, half of them should be on one side of the body, half should be on the other. So when I come in like this, I want to also be measuring. So I don't want those legs to extend out back to the, all the way to the back of the fly. I want it to be just beyond that, um, that thorax. But first thing we're going to do is we're going to lock it in. So what I'm going to do is, it's going to be hard if you're not going to be able to see, but I'll take my fingers and I'm going to pinch it so that those fibers go half and half on either side of that bead. I'm going to kind of hold it there. I'm going to take one loose wrap just behind the bead and I'm going to leave it like that. So now you can see it split them decently on either side. Now I screwed that up by doing that. Do it one more time. And then we're going to be able to pull on that stem and draw it back to create the length of the fibers for the legs that we want. So again, I'm going to pinch that there, take one wrap. I'm going to do two this time so it doesn't fall off when I turn it. So now if you look, you can see I got half on one side, half on the other. And then if I take this mylar and I pull it up through the middle between the two, it forces it down slightly and away from us. But those fibers right there are too long, right? I said I didn't want them to extend out that far. So I can just grab the stem and put a little tug on it. And I can pull it back, pull it back, pull it back. I like where that's sitting now. Those legs aren't too long, it's extending about halfway down the fly. Now I'm going to pull that mylar over. And you can also use your fingers to kind of manipulate those, that, uh, those legs to where you want them. Take a couple wraps to secure it down so it's not moving. Now nothing's permanent here, guys. That's why we're not doing 10 hard, tight wraps. We're doing a couple wraps at a time so I can tug on that mylar if I want it tighter. I can give a little tug on the stem of that feathers to shorten up the legs a bit. Um, is that making sense though, how I described that? Putting that on top and then by pulling that stem, I can pull those legs back to the length that I want them, okay? So that's kind of how we're, we're creating the length that we want. Now we're okay with those legs that we've created going down down over the edge of the fly. We just don't want them to be sitting right up on top of its back. We want it to look more natural by having them go down slightly. And I'm sorry, I know it's really hard to see this small fly on the camera. Um, but what I'm gonna do at this point is I've done a couple more wraps. I'm gonna make sure that I have that good and secure. So maybe do two more wraps and I'm gonna go in there and only when I know that I got the length of legs I want and that mylar when I, where I want it, then I'm gonna go in and snip it off as close as I can. But it's a real bummer if you cut it and everything falls apart. So just make sure you've got it secured. Less is more, especially on the smaller the fly we go, um, the less wraps you want to do and all of that, but you do have to have enough for it to be secure. So what we're going to do from this point is I'm going to quickly whip finish this and then we're going to use a little bit of UV resin to build up a little bit of a back on this guy. If you don't have some UV resin, I've got some, and others around you I'm sure do too. So I'm just going to do one three-turn whip finish. We're going to cover this with UV so we don't need to be crazy about it um, at all. And I'll even go in once I've, once I've got this secure. I like to go in before I put my UV on and just make sure that I got those legs going on either side. And I just use my thumb to kind of mash it back and forth. You can get them set where you want them. It looks good to me. I like where they're at. I'm gonna cheat a little bit more with a tool that I really like. No product plug here, but this is a cautery tool and it is made for flying tying now, not just surgery. <laughs> so if I have any little bit sticking up on the, by the bead there, I can clean it up with that before I put my UV on. Thank you. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in on top of that back. Now thinking I want to make a little bit of a bubble that starts up here, kind of right by the bead and goes just beyond um, that thorax that we created or that flashback that we put on there. So there is such thing as too much UV and this is the place that it happens. So what's best is to put a little bit on, shape it the best that you can. I'll try to do this so you guys can see. I'm just trying to shape a little bubble there. Once I've got just a little bit on, 
I'm gonna touch it with the UV and I'm gonna rebuild again. This is just like putting clear coats on wood. Like you wanna just build it up, it takes a couple coats, harden it, and go again. And you wanna extend it just down onto the body a little bit and up over top of your wraps. I like that right there. The thing about UV is if, if you let it sit there too long, it will start to go around the edges of the hook and you wanna get it nice and locked in before it does that. And that's it guys, that is our Copper John. In the summer, we wouldn't quite often fish this in red as much, um, although there is days that the red works very well. I think they think it's a worm, <laughs> but uh, we fish a lot of green, so a, a lime green Copper John is a really great color on the bow, as well as the natural copper color. But there's all sorts of wire colors out there, so play around with them. Purple ones are really good too. Fish love purple. But that is it guys, that is our Red Copper John. Any questions? Thank you Robert Hirsch from Seattle. He says hi too, tuning in. It's cool to see people from all over the place watching. All right. So once you got that UV set, if you need some resin, just let us know. Lots of people have it here. Okay guys, we're gonna move on to our next pattern, which is our Bow River Bugger. And I'm gonna preempt this one by saying, we're working with deer hair. And when you're working with deer hair, it makes a big mess. So just be conscious of it. Try to keep it corralled on your table so that we can get into a garbage afterwards. It just makes, a, makes cleanup a lot easier for them here as well. I'm just gonna put a few things away here. How'd it turn out, Aaron? Uh, not too shabby for the first one. <laughs> good, good. Another dozen, might be okay. Another dozen yeah. I'm going to be honest, that's one of the better ones I've ever tied. That so I'm going to be. Th <laughs> the first one I tied didn't look like that today. Yeah, I did. Yeah, it's kind of funny to, to say that comment, guys. It's. Uh, it's like anything, you can't expect your first fly. You could be tying for 20 years and you try a new pattern. It's probably not gonna be the best one you ever do, but after a dozen or more, they really, you just get a process and they, you start getting them to look really good. This takes time. It's not gonna happen all at once. It's just nice to not be tying a drake tonight. <laughs> yeah, no drakes tonight. Okay, so our next pattern. If you reach into your little goodie bag there, you're gonna have very few materials because this one doesn't take much. So you're gonna have a piece of grizzly hackle. As my, oh yeah it is. Oh hey Scott from Michigan. He also says hi. Hi Scott. Sorry guys, this, this is new for me. I'm not used to looking up at something telling me what to say. It would be a terrible anchor. Yeah, it would be a terrible anchor. <laughs> <laughs> the news is not what I would want to be reporting these days anyways. So you've got a piece of grizzly hackle and I'll preempt this by saying we've already done some different bugger style flies this year. And there are so many different kinds of hackle to use. Today, you'll see me, I'm gonna tie in a little bit smaller hackle than you are, but not by much. It's still fairly large, even for this pattern. So whether it's um, a woolly bugger or a bow river bugger, you can really vary the, the length of your, um, of your hackle. Whether you could go from saddle hackle to even schlappen, which is a lot longer, and it's just gonna create a little bit different look. Kind of the key points that we're trying to teach in this fly um, is spinning deer hair. We did it once last, once, maybe twice last year. It's, uh, it's not a super easy thing to do, but if you just, if you, uh, you know, watch and stay pretty close with me on it, I think you'll be just fine. So let's get our hook in the vise. So you should have a, another hook in there, a larger hook. So this one, some of you have a little bit differing sizes, but it's either a six or a four. Um, and this is a must add streamer hook. Quick second here. So go ahead and get that secured in the vise. This fly can be tied with weight or without. Um, a lot of times we fish this fly as a second fly, as a second streamer fly. Um, so you got a fly in front that's weighted, 
and this one's gonna be behind, almost coming in at a different level, and it's, it's unweighted, and it has deer hair head, which means it's gonna stay, it's more floating, it'll probably be higher in the water column. Um, you could easily just put a, a cone or a bead on the front of this, and then you've got weight, it's gonna come down a little quicker. But for a spinning deer hair, it's nice to just have the hook to work with, and we don't have to try to bunch it up against a bead. So to teach it, we'll do it this way. So go ahead and get your thread started. I'm gonna use that uh, UTC 140 in black on this fly. So just start up at the eye. We're gonna uh, just lay a nice thread base down the hook. And we're gonna come about to where the, where the barb is or right where the bend starts on the hook. And we're gonna use a piece of marabou, which you should have in there. So color combination we're working with today, we're gonna do uh, a gray hind end on this one and we're gonna use uh, olive deer hair for the head. So what it's gonna look like at the end, hopefully, if we do it right again, it's gonna be something like this, okay? So grab that piece of marabou. I'm gonna find the one I'm looking for here. Oh, that didn't work. You can get really finicky with marabou. What you're gonna do as far as the length of how you're gonna tie this in. Can I see your cup there for a minute, Brian? This is a great idea, like you talked about a couple weeks ago. So this is just a, um, a fly cup that you'd get at, a, get at whatever store. If you put a piece of um, sponge in there and you just put some water on it, you can lay your marabou on it, pull it across, mm -hmm. and now you've moistened your marabou and you don't have to lick it keeps the dye off your, uh, out of your mouth. So when we're measuring the length of this, we wanna go a hook length and length. Okay, so I'm gonna measure up by the eye. Roughly a hook length and length is what we're gonna tie in behind it, okay? So I wouldn't go much more than that. So I've measured basically exactly that. So I'll come back, switch hands, get a gathering wrap in on top. We wanna keep this marabou on top of the hook as well. Take a few wraps to get it nice and secure. Work your thread back so that you're right where you want that tie-in point to be. Okay? And now I'm gonna wrap that marabou on the shank, but we're not gonna go all the way up. We're only gonna go about two-thirds of the way because we want space for that deer hair to spin. It spins a lot nicer if it's just on a thread or on the hook shank, okay? So I'm gonna go up about two-thirds of the way to secure that down and go back to my tie-in point. So we gotta tie in two things here. First thing we're gonna tie in is our, our grizzly hackle. So you're gonna notice with your hackle as well, there is again, always a concave side to it. So there's an underside and a top side. And you can just tell that, you can tell almost that dome that's created. We want that dome, so the bottom sides of the domes, if it, if it leans down like this and this is our bottom side, that's what we wanna be pointed rearward. So I'm gonna tip it up like so. So when we wrap it forward, it doesn't look like those grizzly fibers are pointing forward up the fly, we want them to point backwards. And that's the best way to tell, is once you start to tie it in, you'll notice, because if it looks like they're pushing the wrong way, you know you gotta just back off your thread, retie it in. So I'm gonna peel off a little bit at the back. You don't wanna waste too much, because your guys' feathers, and if it's not long enough to get all the way up, most of you should have, should have a piece long enough. We, uh, we checked them out before we did this. Um, we're just gonna do an open spiral up. So we need to, we wanna basically use up the exact amount of um, hackle that we have. So I've, create, I've exposed a bit of a stem here. So remembering I want that concave pointed back, I'm just gonna go in, I'm gonna lock it down. Okay, and I'm, and I'm gonna take that stem and lock that stem down up the fly. I tied it, sorry guys, I tied it in from the butt end. So I stripped off those fibers at the butt end and that's where I tied it in. So a good question though, reason for doing that is the fibers are longer at the back. So once we get rid of all that fluff, when we get to the actual fibers, um, then when we come forward, it's bigger at the back and it thins out to that head. Okay? Butt in. Because we're gonna lay it all back with the, it's, that, that's right, it's not a bad thing to tie it in at the tip. You're thinking that you want the bigger to be at the head and that's, that's true, but with this fly, we're creating, um, that head is what's gonna push everything back, okay? So that's where we want that bulk to sit. 
So next thing we're going to tie in is you should have a piece of this stuff today is speckled chenille in gold black. <laughs> Mark from Indiana says hello. The people love the shout outs and I'm not paying attention. Sorry guys, I'll do better. Dana's doing jumping jacks at the back. <laughs> Look up. So we're gonna go, same thing I did there guys, is I peeled off a few of those fibers so I could expose a little bit of that thread that holds them together on the inside. And that's what we're gonna tie in, okay? So we're gonna come in on top of there, tie in those fibers right where we tied in that hackle. So we bring them back to the same point, same point together. And then we're gonna wrap forward. Okay, we're gonna bring our thread up to about that two thirds mark again. So if you can kind of think about portioning off your fly. Um, I've got two thirds that I'm gonna wrap with this stuff and I'm gonna leave a third up front for that head. So go ahead and we're gonna wrap forward the chenille. So just nice touching wraps as we move up. Just covering up all that thread that's underneath we put on there. And you can definitely vary the chenille that you use. It doesn't have to just be um, this short stuff. You could go to a longer like polar chenille or something like that as well. Nothing wrong with that. Just different materials gives you different, uh, different movement in the water. Once you got it tied in there, you can snip that out. And once we got that locked in, guys, we're just gonna go with an open spiral. So taking that, uh, that hackle, making sure you've maintained the orientation of it that you want, and just do open spiral wraps. See that spun on me? So you can tell right away, I could tell that they weren't pointing the direction that I wanted them to be pointed. So that I can reorient it and start again. And fixed it that time. So we're just wrapping it forward. So just depending on how much material you have to work with for that feather, you, just, you will either take less wraps, move quicker forward, or you can take more wraps if you have a little bit longer piece. Dylan from Red Deer, thanks for tuning in, bud. Okay, I'll give you guys a sec to catch up there. And we're tying this on a little, little bit bigger scale than we might use it um, day to day. I like this fly a little bit smaller than this, maybe down to a size six or eight, and maybe not as long a hook shank. Um, but this can be a really good, just the streamer to throw, not as a secondary or anything, just fishing these. We all know the woolly bugger is probably one of the best streamer patterns ever created, probably caught most fish. Um, and this, that's the same pattern as this. The only thing we're doing is we're adding a deer hair head to it. So lots of different sizes, shapes, and colors that you can tie this in. So now the fun stuff starts. So we gotta work with some deer hair now. Um, what I have here, this is just some primo deer hair. I got a big long strip of it here. Um, we're basically going to use two clumps, so all of you here, we've, I've got you a couple clumps ahead of time. We're looking about pencil thick is what we're going to be cutting off. We've got to clean out the under fluff that's in it. That's a really important part. If we don't get that fluff out, it's not going to spin the way we want it to. Um, so I'll kind of show you how I do that as we go. The first one, we're going to be creating the collar out of. So it's important that we're going to stack the tips so that we have a nice um, actual tips of the fibers we're going to create the collar with. The next one, we're, not gonna, we're actually going to cut the tips off so that we're not working with such long pieces because the tips aren't important on the second stack. Okay? So let's go ahead. I'll show you first. I'm going to grab about a pencil width thick. If you're going to go thicker on one than the other, this collar is the place to do it so that we have lots of collar that encircles the entire fly. So I'm going to go in and cut it. 
There's lots of under fluff in this material. And as you work with deer hair, you just get better at switching hands and not letting all the, all the deer hair fall apart. Um, but I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna pinch the tips like this. I'll let go with my backhand. Um, if, you just, if you don't have a comb or something, you can flick it like this with your finger and you can work some of that fluff out. I like to comb it if you can. Um, that normally does a little bit better job at getting it out. And you can see all that fluff that's coming out of there and we wanna make sure that it's all out. So I normally take a little bit wider comb and then one that's not as wide. And then go ahead and stick it tips first into your hair stacker. And let's stack those tips up. Really gotta emphasize though, get that fluff out. It makes your life a lot easier. So once we've got that stacked, you always want to you always want to think about the orientation of everything that you're doing. So keep it easy for yourself. So I know my hair stacker like this. If I pull the, the butt off here, those are nice stacked and they're already pointed down the down the fly in the direction that I want them to be. So I don't have to grab them out, flip them over, do all this, and then all the tips I lose they lose their alignment right away. So they're ready to go back down the direction of the fly. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come in and just pinch them. So I like run my finger down the edge of the stacker, pinch them so they're all locked together. It's another good time to work out any fluff. And this time what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go in and cut a little bit of length off because we're gonna be trimming these down with a, a razor that you guys should have. So I'm gonna come and take, take some of the length off of this so it makes my life easier. Because this deer hair is quite long actually. Now I've got it in this finger and I'm holding the tips aligned. This is the one time I'm gonna have to switch my hand so I can see those tips because I need to be able to measure how long I want this collar to sit. So it's really important that when you make this switch that you don't lose the alignment of your tips. So I like to just kind of encircle my fingers around it with three fingers normally and I just hold it. And so I've maintained my tips where I want them to be. Um, but now I've got a hold of the butt end so I can tie this in. So this collar, we want the collar itself to extend about halfway down the fly. So we are going to cover up some of that hackle that we put in there. And that's kind of why I told you to orientate to tying in the butt end of the hackle first, okay? So I want that to extend about halfway down the fly. So this is my measuring time. I'm able to measure it. I can see where that's going to be. And now again, I'm going to have to switch hands because I need to get my hands on the tips to then start wrapping. And it's this wrapping sequence that's pretty important to get the, the spin to happen, okay? So if you watch me here, I'm going to take, I'm going to switch. I'm gonna pinch those on top. I'm gonna to take a nice loose wrap over top. I'm gonna to take a second wrap over top and I'm gonna pull a little tighter this time. You see those fibers start to flare. They start flaring. I'm gonna take a third wrap and it start, I'm letting it spin with my fingers a little bit more, a little bit more and I'm actually encouraging it around the edge of the fly. Now one more wrap, I let go and pull tight. And if you've done it properly, that one wasn't perfect. But it should flare that hair. The biggest bummer at this point is if you, uh, if you pull too tight with your thread and it breaks, then you gotta start all over. So all we're looking for is to make sure that we have a nice collar, like you can see underneath here. Those tips look really nice. They've, uh, you can use your thumb to get in there to fill in any gaps that you might see. But for the most part, it looks pretty good. On this one, I can tell that I didn't use quite enough deer hair. So I'm just gonna take a little clump. And that's the nice thing about this stuff is you can go in and work with it again. So I'm just gonna take a tiny little piece. I'm gonna stack my tips again. And I'm just gonna add this into the backside at the same length. There we go, that's a little better. And now what we want to do is we want to work our thread up through those fibers. So I start to kind of push them back and I need to get my thread up to the front. So I kind of wiggle it through and I make maybe one or two wraps through the entire piece as I go forward. But what that does is it really locks those fibers down. Um, and now there's different tools to help you with this. I'm not sure where mine went here. 
So I just got this, actually I think there's a, a tube that Crelex came in or something, but a pen, a pen that you take the center out of works just as well. And I just use it to almost push that hair back, okay? And that allows me to get my thread to come through to the front. And I want to make a few thread wraps right in front of where that deer hair ends. And we call it stacking deer hair. So I'm, I'm actually using this to push that deer hair back a bit. Creating myself just enough room so that I can put in my next piece. And if you've really crowded that eye, then you're gonna use less, just less material than you would, would have the next time, okay? So I've pushed that back. I've exposed enough space that I'm like, yep, that's good. It's gonna work to get another chunk in there. And now you guys should have a second, a second piece of uh, deer hair. We're gonna go again with about a pencil width. I want you to go ahead and cut it cut it off the patch, or if you already have it, clean it out. But don't, I'll just emphasize not to overdo it on this front one. Don't put so much. We're going to be shaving this down. You don't need to get crazy with the amount. So I'm going to clean it out. A uh, good question was, can you add any lead weight under, under the chenille or non-lead, whatever um, product you're using? And the answer is yes, of course. That's a really easy way to weight this fly without using a bead or a cone, is just to put a layer underneath, right underneath the hook, on the hook, just put a lead wraps like we put on the last fly. Use a little bit bigger um, size and just do it like that. Good question. So this time I have these tips here. I don't need the tips, I'm not building a collar anymore. So I'm gonna go in and I'm just gonna cut back where that color change is get rid of those tips, okay? And now I'm gonna repeat the same process I just did the last time. I'm gonna pull that deer hair back a little bit out of the way. I'm gonna lay it kind of at this 45 deg degree angle up. That deer hair about 50-50 on the hook, so it's uh, half up, half from the top, half from the bottom as far as length is concerned. I'm gonna go take that nice single wrap once, twice, on the third one pull it tight and it spins. So one loose, second one I start to tighten, third one I go really tight and I let go with my fingers and it should spin around the edge of the hook. And then same thing, I just wanna work my, my thread through so that it shows up here again. And the best critique of yourself when you're working with deer hair is actually when you go to shave it. So if you didn't stack it properly, um, you didn't push it tight enough, when you go to shave it, you're gonna have a bald spot. Um, and that's just experience of working with deer hair. A lot of us avoid it because we don't really love working with it. Um, but it's such, a, it's such a cool material for a lot of reasons. But you can shape it really well by cutting it. And it has a lot of really nice floating properties. So you just use it for different things. Okay, so it doesn't look like much right now. We got some trimming to do. And you can trim it with scissors or you can trim it with, uh, with a razor blade. Today I'll show you how to do it with a razor blade. So, I got both of those stacks on there. You want to whip finish at this point. Um, what, I, what I'm going to suggest is I actually don't whip finish. I, do, I use, what, in essence, a half hitch tool. So I'm going to use the same thing that I use to push all those fibers back. And what I do is I just come up, place it on my thread, I wrap around it twice, and then I use the hole on the end there, I put it over the eye of my hook, so it pushes all that hair back out of the way. And I just use my finger to work that thread down and I can just push it off the end of it and pull it tight. And that makes a nice knot, okay? And I'll do it two or three times. And then I am gonna put some resin on this so that I know it's locked in as well. I, the reason I like to do this is if, if you watch someone try to whip finish, I'll go show you here, try to whip finish like this, if you've crowded your eye at all and you're trying to hold all the hair back out of the way and get your whip finish in, it's, it's just not as easy. It's doable, but not as easy. So I prefer just to do a half hitch because I know I'm going to touch it with resin right away. Especially if you're using UV, you know it's going to not go anywhere. Once you got it locked in where you want it, you can trim your thread out of the way. I, at this point, before I do any trimming, I'm going to go in and touch it with, um, I'm going to use UV. This stuff is just like a, a head cement re uh, resin, so it's really thin. So all I want to do is touch those wraps, just so I know this isn't going anywhere when I start cutting. But even some Sally Hansons, whatever you got, um, just get, get a little bit of something on those threads. There we 
There we go. And I'd rather see you have a little bit of space behind the head than have crowded it too much. And that's, that's, that's honestly one of the toughest things about working with deer hair and stacking it is it's really easy to overdo it. And now this is where you just get to play. Um, you just gotta get in there with a razor blade. I'll show you kind of how to do it with this razor blade. I, uh, I'm trying to remember what brown these ones are. It's just a double edged razor blade. I actually just snap it in half. So when it's, it comes in its package, it'll look like this is one solid one. I fold it in half and break it. I find it a little safer because I doesn't feel like I'm gonna cut my other finger the way I'm holding it. So I just take half of it. They're very flexible. Be very careful with them when you use them, but they're flexible like this. So I can take it, I can bend it, I can create more of the shape that I want as I go. I want to kind of run my fingers through this hair and kind of pull it forward a bit. So when I'm cutting it, it doesn't lay back on itself. So I kind of bush it up a little bit. Um, for myself, I like a flat bottom on this fly. So if you look at this last one I just did a few minutes ago. So on the bottom, I just made it flat. So it's just got a flat bottom on it. It's not, I got almost a cone shape on top and I just cut a flat side on the bottom. Just changes the way it swims a little bit. So I fly flip my fly upside down. And the, the key here is guys, don't just go with one foul swoop with that, um, with that razor, just little touches. It's very, very sharp. It cuts that deer hair like nothing. So just come in and do little touches. Kind of move it out of the way so you can see what you're doing. It's nice little touches. When we get right down to the end of it, we can, we can mess around with our scissors too because they can be a little bit more finite to work with them. Um, I'm just gonna start by just making a nice flat bottom on it. Okay? And now I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna almost use this tool in this uh, almost a dome feeling. So I come from the bottom and I just push hair up into a dome. I keep doing that motion and that kind of creates the, the head that I want out of it. But key here is guys, don't cut so far into that collar that you created because if once you cut it, it's gone. <laughs> so if you want to maintain a collar on the fly, you got to be careful how far you cut into it. And I'm just maintaining that kind of that bend on the razor blade as I go around the edges and the top. And I'm just, just slowly touching working my way around, being very mindful of where that collar is because I can see it underneath and just not getting too close to it until I want to. And it's just a little game of finesse. Like I said, you can go in with your scissors at the end and, and pick out the little pieces that you want to get out if you missed them. But as you can see there, I've got that collar underneath. And at this point, I got a pretty good shaped head. It's a little flat on the bottom like I like. I'm happy with that. I got the dome on either sides. And now I'm just gonna go in and clean up. There's just a few fibers that are stray that, are, um, that aren't collar fibers and those are the ones you wanna get rid of. So I will go in with my scissors at this point. And I'm gonna get in there and pull those fibers out that I don't want. I like my collar in there. And once you're pretty happy with it, guys, the, the key here is stop trimming. If it looks good, stop trimming, because once you over trim, you can't put more deer hair back on. So once you get the general shape that you're looking for and you're happy with it, just stop trimming. Okay? Other style of trimming it, guys, is you could have made that dome look on the entire fly. I cut a bit of a flat bottom into it you could leave that rounded as well. They both just swim a little different in the water. It's like putting like the, on the front of a Rapala, you have a bill on it. Well, depending on the shape of that bill will depend on how it swims through the water. So kind of creating the same idea. So a question, Dana, can you bring it back to the top so I can see it again? Question is, do you ever run head cement at the very end through the head fibers after trimming, shaping it? Is it worth extra effort for durability? Um, yes and no. I don't, I don't do it on this fly, and I'll tell you why. I don't overpack this one. Let's say I'm doing a, um, a head on a sex dungeon. 
you're putting more material, you're building a bigger head and a collar. I really push and stack those hairs down. And if I put like resin over top of that hair, all it actually does is smooth it out. And I just created the angle that I want it to swim it. With this one, this is gonna hold more air. So if I put resin in there, all it's gonna do is take up all the air that's filling it to make it a little bit more floatable and it negates it. So I would say don't do it if you're hoping to have an unweighted fly. Um, if you already have, let's say, a pair of dumbbell eyes or a cone in there and you want it for durability, go ahead. But the biggest key is if you've got those tight wraps and you've spun it properly, when you come up to that head and you put some cement there, you've locked it down and you're pretty safe. But good question. Again, experiment. You're going to find how you fish flies for different species, some species. Um, you know, if I was tying a Buford head on a pike fly, you know, a pike's teeth are a lot sharper than anything else. And on a, it'll, they just tear up those heads. So I would maybe do it more on there. Every time I spun the deer hair, I would add resin. Spin the next stack, add resin. But that's just a species dependent and what you're using it for. But really good question. That's our Bow River Bugger, guys. Pretty simple. Um, I, I really encourage you to, to go home and mess with deer hair. Don't even worry about the rest of the fly. Just take a hook out, spin some deer hair on it and shape it. It's a great tool to have, um, you know, even into dry fly fishing. We're, you know, we'll tie, let's say at X caddis, you, you, you're tying deer hair on and you're using the flare of it, you're using how to trim it, everything. That's just on a smaller scale. So once you understand the properties of hair and how it works, um, it's a real, a real great material to use. I think a lot of us are moving away to synthetic things and it's good to come back to the, you know, to the original materials. I think there's a lot of value in using those. Um, yeah, any questions from you guys? Good? So again, remember, um, next Thursday, again, hosting IF4, Canyon Meadow Theatres, so we won't be here next week. Um, and then again, on the 30th of January, we won't be here due to that event that's happening here at Carabelle. Um, but hey, if somebody else is, if there's another brewery or somebody else out there who's watching and they're like, hey, we want, we'd like you to come here and host it that night, if we can arrange something to be somewhere else, we might just do that, so we'll let you know. Okay. It doesn't, doesn't even have to be a brewery. That's right. So guys, I want to thank you again for coming out tonight, uh, toughing out the cold. For you guys at home, thanks for uh, making some remarks tonight. It's uh, great to hear from you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Again, I'm Tim Hepworth here with Fly Fishing Board of Outfitters. Thanks again for coming out, guys.